What's going on guys? Welcome to NetSec Explain. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to level up your bug bounty and pen testing skills with Docker containers. Now, I'm not gonna go into detail about what Docker is or what containers are. Instead, I'm going to assume that you already know those things. If you don't, then I highly recommend checking out the video Docker in 100 Seconds by Fireship. The link is in the description below. Instead, for this video, I'm gonna show you how to add Docker into your testing process. So, let's get started. Picture this. You're testing a remote system built on top of a popular web framework, say Django or Drupal. But there's just one problem. You don't know what this application looks like from an admin perspective. Now, you can spend hours building a virtual machine, installing all the dependencies, and configuring the system to build the app locally. Or, you can spend a lot less time to spin up a Docker container and run the app that way. In fact, I ran into this exact same problem with Rails, Django, Java, Drupal, and Node.js. You name it. If I went the VM route, that would be five different virtual machines, each with their own setup and configuration and I'd have to snapshot each one just in case I ran into another app that needed to use those systems in the future. See, that's where the benefits of Docker containers comes into play. Setting up VMs with a custom configuration is difficult. While containers act as virtual environments, they're designed to be spun up and torn down. This lets you build a fresh environment every time. You can also script and automate your infrastructure management for speed and manageability. With a fresh environment every time, they prevent unwanted artifacts from staying in your system. Still not convinced? Let's take a look at a few examples. I have four major ways that you can use Docker containers right now. Starting with number one, building a virtual lab environment. Say we want to create a virtual lab of vulnerable machines for practice, specifically DVWA and the OWASP juice shop. Normally, this would require a VM with PHP, Apache, SQL, and Node. Instead, let's see if these have any Docker images. We can go to Docker Hub to look up the images, and we can look up Jushop. And sure enough, the first link links us to a Docker image of the OWASP Jushop. Now, Docker Hub works just like GitHub, where anybody can upload an image you need to be smart about what you download and what you run. So to check the image contents, you can take a look at the GitHub link on the side. So this is gonna pop that open. The thing that I also do is I will go to the original project page and see if it references a Docker image on Docker Hub. So if I go here to uh, DigiNinja, the DVWA, I can just control F to look for a Docker and it sends me Docker container to a Docker Hub page uh, under Vulnerables Web DVWA. So I can go ahead and click on that. And here we go. This is the Docker image. Same thing for OWASP Juice Shop. This is the OWASP page. You can do a Control F, look for Docker, go ahead, open up the Docker image. And I can see that this BKMI, uh, BKIM Juice Shop is the officially supported Docker image for Juice Shop. Cool. Let's take a look at how to run some of these. So what I'm gonna do is copy this. It is the Docker pull command, just like Git. So I'm going to go ahead, right click paste. You can also enter in control shift V. This is gonna pull the latest version. And then we can run this with docker run dash d for daemon mode, and then we need to expose a port. The format for this is the host IP address. In this case, I don't want vulnerable systems accessible to the internet or to anybody else on my network. So I'm just gonna type in the local host, 127.001. Uh, for this, we're gonna enter in port 3000 because that's the port that this node server is running on. And then I'm gonna go ahead and grab the image name. I'm doing control shift C, control shift V, and that's gonna start up and run in the background. Likewise, I'm gonna do the same thing with DVWA. 
I'm gonna grab the Docker pull, paste that in, run that to pull the latest image, and then I'm going to do Docker run. Uh, we're gonna do this in the background with a daemon mode, dash p, 127.001, and this one is gonna open up on port 80. So the order is localhost, uh, or the host IP address, and then the local port on the host that you want exposed mapped to the Docker port on the container that you want to open. And then for this, I'm gonna go ahead and open up Vulnerables Web DVWA, and that's gonna run in the background. So now I can open up a new window and I can go to 127.001 port 3000. And this is going to show me a Wasp juice shop. Cool. You can go ahead, register an account, log in, and do all the fun stuff. The other one is going to be on port 80, and this is gonna show me DVWA. So now I can log in with the default with admin admin. Don't save. And this will take me to the setup page where I can configure the application and get that to run. Awesome. Now, before we move on to the next one, I wanna show you how to shut these down because I don't want vulnerable systems running all the time. So to do that, I'm gonna go ahead, jump back to my terminal. I'm gonna type in docker ps, and this is gonna give us the process list. Uh, what we can do is docker stop, and then we can grab the process name, and that's gonna stop the individual process. The other thing that I like to do is docker ps dash q, which is gonna be short for quiet mode. And we can see this AEB19. And we see AEB19 is going to be the only thing that's being returned by this. So if I have several images that I wanna stop, I can simply do docker stop and then dollar sign paren docker ps dash q and that's going to stop all of the images that are running. Cool. And one last Docker PS, and there we go. Now we can move on to number two, using containers to share POCs. Okay, we just found an awesome exploit, maybe a zero day, and we wanna show off our work. We'll need other people to test out the exploit code against the exact same application with the exact same configuration. Now, we can try to share a VM, but even the smallest VMs tend to be at least a couple gigs in size. Instead, let's take a look at how we did this in the Java deserialization video series. So I've already pre-compiled uh, for my system uh, Docker Labs in my GitHub. So let's go ahead, grab the link to clone this. But before we go ahead and download it, let's take a look at the Java deserialization and the JBoss section and look at this Docker file. Now the way that it starts off is we download the base JBoss image and we give instructions to expose port 8080. We set up some environment variables for server home and the JBoss home. We assume that we're gonna be using the user root we make the server home directory, and then the next run command uh, moves to the server home directory, downloads JBoss 6.1.0 and the JDK 7, and unzips those tar files. Then we configure the run.config file with the Java 7 version, and we go ahead and set our entry point as opt JBoss run.sh, and we bind to the local host address which is going to be the local host address of the container itself. So now we can jump back to the terminal, git clone, paste that in. Jump to the JBoss directory, and now we can do our docker build. We're going to build from the local directory, and then we'll just tag this with the simple name JBoss. This is going to go ahead and run, and I'm going to go ahead and jump forward a little bit. Cool. 
Now that that's built, we can go ahead and do our docker run. So docker run dash D for daemon mode. I'm going to expose ports only on the local system. And then this is going to be port 8080, which is what we saw in the instructions. And then I'm gonna go ahead and run JBoss. Awesome. So I'm gonna give that a minute to spin up. It takes a little bit with JBoss, uh, but then we can visit the actual JBoss server. And here we go. You can access the admin console or any of the other pages. Uh, this is JBoss running, or I should say a vulnerable version of JBoss running in our Docker containers. So now all we have to do is share out the Docker file and people can build this locally. It has the same configuration and everything else involved. Speaking of the Java video series, this leads us to number three, running a portable security applications. In the series, we use the tool Why So Serial to craft our exploit code. Instead of compiling it from source on my local system, I downloaded their Docker file to run it that way. Doing this, you can also download and run other portable security applications, like Metasploit, for example. That way you don't have to worry about compiling tools yourself. So to do that, I can go ahead and visit the GitHub page for Why So Serial. Go ahead, grab the Git link, move back to the Docker directory, clone the link, and hop into YSO Serial. Here we have a Docker file, so now I can just do the same thing, docker build dash T, and I'll call this YSO Serial. Awesome. Now we can just use Docker to go ahead and run this. So if I do docker run yso serial dash dash help, it'll run the application and show us the help message. If I wanted to craft a POC exploit, I could do docker run yso serial do a simple hello world. So run that. And here is the binary Java serialized data. Awesome. One last example to look at. Number four, building a virtual app environment. So oftentimes, as InfoSec people, we find ourselves working in environments and with languages that we're not familiar with. Instead of going through the whole process of creating a new virtual machine, installing all the necessary dependencies, and configuring the system, we can just have Docker do that for us. It also helps to keep the environment contained and easy to spin up or tear down. For example, let's write a script in Ruby. Now, I don't have Ruby installed on the system, but I can pull the Docker image and run that instead. So I can do that with docker run. I'm going to do dash IT for interactive and then Ruby. And I'm going to run bin bash in order to hop into the Docker container. So here I'm in the Docker container. I can access the Ruby interactive shell with IRB and run a short little Ruby script. And there you have it. Four examples on how you can use Docker containers in your testing and assessments. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. For more information, check out the links in the description below, and don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos like this. I'll see you next time.